Hi everyone, this is a preview into one of my more popular Patreon tutorials. As you can see, it's a lovely red fox. So this tutorial, like my others, is completed in pastels. So I use a mixture of soft pastels and pastel pencils. So you'll see here, I'm starting off with the nose first. So I like to use a Cretacolor black for the darkest areas. So a Cretacolor is just that little bit darker than any regular blacks from Stabilo and Faber-Castell. Perfect for any areas like pupils, nostrils, and the nose, which is particularly dark. As always I'm breaking down my tones at the base stage so with the nose I'm looking at where the lightest areas are so in this picture we see the lightest area is sat at the top so with my lighter grey tone just tinting on top of the base also adding a little bit of blue in as well so blue always helps to make noses look nice and shiny and nice and wet as well a little pop of highlight as well and then straight onto the eyes. So I usually start off with the eyes first or the nose, and that's because they often hold the most detail and they are generally the main focus in a portrait. So your eyes are drawn to those areas first, and in particular the eyes, they're very important to get right because they hold the most life and the most expression. So if you start off with them first and you make a mistake and you want to scrap the piece, then you've only wasted a little bit of time. If you leave the eyes until last, then you've wasted hours and hours of work and it's a little bit more painful to start all over again. So personally, I always start with those eyes first. I know a lot of artists do as well. I normally outline with my black pastel pencil and then just start to fill in the iris. So that's the area around the eye. These eyes you'll see are really nice and vibrant, nice and red. So I'm using a mixture of burnt sienna and burnt okra as well. These lovely orange and reddy brown tones. So I'm then moving up to the highlight. With the highlight, I always leave this until I've got the base down for the iris, just because the highlights generally are very, very bright. What you don't want to do is work that highlight first, so the white area first, and then work loads of color around it because you'll end up blowing that excess, the colorful excess across the white area. And that's of course going to just darken it slightly. So you want to make sure the highlights really, really pop. So leaving them until last, is what I generally recommend. So lots of cool tones for the highlights that again, like the nose, it helps the areas to look nice and glassy, nice and shiny. I use a mix of Stabilo and Faber-Castell and Caran d'Ache as well. As you can see, this pencil here is Caran d'Ache. I just like to have a wide range of different brands, different tones in my collection. The key to realism is having multiple tones in your work. You want to try and use lots from different family groups. So not just two browns, try and use at least four or five because for example, brown fur, it's never just going to be a couple of tones. There's going to be lots of different browns in there, especially in those different areas of the face and the body. The tutorial itself on Patreon, it's all real time. So this is just a preview. There's obviously bits that are sped up, bits that are just cut. So I'm just jumping to, so I'm jumping around to make it nice and condensed. But obviously, if you do sign up to the Patreon channel, all of my tutorials are full length, start to finish, with a voiceover, material list provided up front, with an outline as well, and the reference image. This, hopefully, this preview will just show you my personal way of working with this medium, as well as my teaching style as well. I think a lot of people do like to hear the voice and hear the ways that things are being explained before signing up. Otherwise, it's a little bit of an unknown, isn't it? So for the background, I always use my Unison Soft Pastels. So these are, like the name suggests, really beautifully soft. So the Unison ones I love just because they have such a wide variety of different tones. You'll see this fox has a lovely soft brown backdrop. It's slightly out of focus, especially with the grassy areas going on. So what I'm doing is I'm just breaking down the background into different sections. So you've got the dark sections, medium sections, and light sections. And I'm literally just mapping them in here very roughly with a few brown tones. There's a light beige tone going in as well, and my dark tones. So it looks a little bit of a mess at the moment, but once you blend that in, which I'm doing now with my pan pastel sponge, 
you'll see it's all blending together really nicely. You're starting to get rid of any lines. You will need a couple more layers to build up. Obviously at the moment, this is the initial layer, so you can still see some of those strokes going down. But once you get a couple more layers down, we'll start to cover the paper a little bit more. The beauty about this paper that I'm using, which is the pastel matte paper, this one's in the shade sand, is that it can take over 10 layers. So it's a lot better than the other pastel papers that I've tried, which can't take as many layers. It doesn't take much for them to quickly become saturated, which means you then can't layer more pastel on top, which is highly frustrating. So this pastel paper is hands down the best that I've ever come across. So you can also use a few pastel pencils in your background once those initial layers are down. So I sometimes like to just add a pop of a few additional tones in there as well. So they do need a little bit more blending out because they're hard instead of soft. So the soft pastels are a lot better for blending, especially with those soft backgrounds. So starting on the grass, I'm being a little bit more precise with my pastel pencil. If you need more accuracy, obviously you're not really going to get that very well with a soft pastel. So for any details in that background, you can use a pastel pencil and that will give you the level of detail that you need. Cut out that tree on the right. I just felt like it would just make the portrait a little bit too busy. So I just cut that out and just left it nice and plain. I also use a couple of tones from the brand Smink. So I use their black soft pastel and their white soft pastel just because I find they're a lot more highly pigmented than the black and the white from Unison. So over the years, I've obviously done a lot of trial and error, a lot of experimentation with different brands. And the beauty about my tutorials is I've narrowed down all of these different tones, the different brands, and I've selected really the best of the best. So the ones that work really, really well for wildlife and pet portraits. So when it comes to the fur, exactly the same process. We want to start from dark into medium, then into light. So around the mouth, He's got a lot of dark fur going on just around the nose there. So I started off with a little bit of dark grey and then I'm going to start to map in the base for the light area of fur. So I'm starting off with a really, really light grey tone. My advice for light fur is you don't want to start off with a brilliant white, really, really heavy, because what's going to happen is you'll end up making the base too light so that when it comes to adding your white hair details, it will be really, really hard to see those details on top of a really, really light base. You want to just make sure that the base is just a tiny bit darker than the white pastel pencil that's going to be pulling out your details. I get that question a lot. How do you make your white hairs stand out on your base? Well, the key is, as I say, just make sure it's just that little bit darker. And then once you add one or two layers of white hairs down, that should pull it up just enough that it's the correct level that we see in the photograph. So at the base stage, it's all about mapping. It's creating a map of where the dark areas sit, which are usually where the structure is. So that's where you've got bone going on, you've got the muscle as well. So with the fox face, there's a lot of kind of shadowing. It is dark fur as well, but just down from his eye, that's where the nose starts to curve around. So naturally you will start to get a little bit of a shadow there. So it's starting to make sure that the shape is correct at the base stage. And then it's very simple, makes your life a lot easier when it comes to adding those hairs in because you know exactly where to curve them, where to shape them round, and that's going to make the face a lot more three-dimensional. So I've blended that out a little bit with my sponge there. So this fur is obviously very, very vibrant. Vibrant fur is, I would say, one of the more challenging types of fur because there's a lot of danger of muddying your tones, making them murky by mixing them together. 
especially when you've got dark areas next to vibrant areas. What you don't want to do is mix any black in with any orange because it's going to create a really ugly colour. So I tend to like to, unlike the background, which isn't particularly vibrant, work my base tones in separately. So I do know a lot of artists that do it slightly differently. I mean, there isn't a wrong or right way, but a few artists will map in all the base tones all over the face, all over the body at the start. I personally, to make sure that the vibrancy remains and is nice and punchy, is work the tones in one by one. So you'll kind of see this as I'm working these layers up. I'm trying not to blend them into each other too much. I'm just taking my time, blocking in all of these different sections. You'll see in the center of the nose here, it is very, very bright and orange. So I'm starting off with a nice orange tone as a base and then starting to lighten it with an ivory. So it looks a little bit traumatic at the moment, but I do find with Vibrant Fur, it's often easier to start off at the base stage, going a little bit too vibrant, and then it's so easy to just pull it down ever so slightly towards the end of the base stage if it's looking a little bit too bright. It's harder to start off dull and then try and pull that vibrancy up. It's virtually impossible. So I always like to go a little bit too overboard to start off with and then just start to pull the tone down a little bit if it needs to be, just with some normal colours like medium browns and yellows that aren't too bright. So you'll see that shape's really coming together now. It's also important as you go to strengthen up your tone. So don't just use a couple of layers, keep going until all of the grittiness is gone. So the grittiness is normally when you haven't quite blended it into the paper properly. So make sure when you're blending, you do push quite hard with your sponge. You can also use your fingers, which I do a lot, but a couple of points, make sure your fingers, your hands are always clean before you do touch the paper so go give them a wash and a dry because any kind of sweat or oil that you have on your fingers will leave a slight residue on your paper and that will affect how the pastel sits on the paper that's very important and also don't blend with your fingers in the first couple of base stages you really do need that sponge to push the pigment into the paper and get all of your layers to look really soft and seamless. With the fingers, it's a little bit harder to get that soft finish. So the fingers really are just for when you get towards the middle and end stage of the base process and you want to maintain your dark tones and your vibrant tones, the sponge, it's great for the first stages, but once you get towards the end and you just need to shift the pigment a little bit and just press it into the paper a touch, the sponge can be a little bit too good. It does its job too well. So it will shift those final layers too much. It will push them into the paper too much. Therefore, any dark areas will be lightened slightly, which you don't want, and any light areas will be darkened too much as well. Absolutely fine to use your fingers, as I say, just make sure they are clean. So you'll see I'm just starting to work some details because the base is looking lovely and vibrant, nice and thick. You'll see how I've managed to lighten up that nose section. I started off with quite a nice light base and then I've just gone over with a couple of layers of my ivory hairs, which has worked an absolute treat. It's lifted that really, really nicely. So another thing to mention about my tutorials is they do also come with an outline, which I know a lot of people do want, just so they're not faffing for ages trying to get that outline to look accurate. It's always helpful when you know the outline is correct and you can just go straight in and work on your pastel technique. So there's lots of tips on my Patreon channel as well not just full-blown lessons, but also kind of business tips, ideas on framing your artwork, how I get my outline transferred onto the paper as well, how to care for your pastel artwork, lots and lots of different tips. And of course, you can request tips as well. If you need any help with something in particular, you can always just drop me a message. So his face is really starting to come together now. The dark brown that I like to use for Vibrant Fur is the Dark Flesh from Caran which is number 748. This has lots of pink tones to it. 
So with this fox, there's lots of red tones, obviously, lots of orange, but there's also a few hidden tones, which are pinks, which you wouldn't immediately think were there. But if you zoom into the photograph, you can start to pick out whether some of the browns lean a little bit more on the pink side. So especially around the eyes, there's tiny hints of a fleshy tone going on. So that's why I used a little bit more of a pink based brown in that area. These tutorials as well should hopefully start to help you to color swatch as well. So that's picking tones out and matching them. So knowing which tones to go for to match what we can see in the photograph. Over years and years and years of practice, I now, it's like second nature, I just know which tones to grab for which specific areas. It's not so much of a guessing game anymore. So with practice, if any of you are struggling with that, that should come with time. And obviously these tutorials should help you out as well because you'll see which tones I go for and then you can compare them to the reference image that you can see on the screen. So starting to work around the rest of the face as well. So you'll see I'm using a mixture of my soft pastels and my pastel pencils to build up the base. So I normally like to use those soft pastels as the first initial layer of base going down just to cover the paper because it blends so beautifully, those unison pastel pencils. And then I'll go over the top just to strengthen up and get some additional tones in as well with my pastel pencils. With the base stage and also with your detail stage, one of the most important things to remember is soft transitional changes. We don't want any dramatic changes going on. So what that means is if you've got dark areas next to light areas, so where I'm working here, you've got the dark edge of the eye and then you've got the light fur going on. You want to make sure there's a transitional tone in between your light areas and your dark areas so that they merge into each other really, really gradually. So that will make your fur look really nice and natural. If you've got any dark areas which dramatically stop and then you've got your light areas starting, it's just going to look really unnatural. Even with striped fur, so with tigers, with zebras, even though it looks from a distance like it's literally black and white or orange and black, there's always going to be a slight, what I call a bleed on the edge of the stripe, which means it's transitioning into the color next to it nice and gradually. So if you were to zoom in on a stripe border, so say a zebra, for example, if you zoom in on a black stripe, you'll get some gray hairs, some brown hairs just on the edge. And that's just where the fur starts to change tone slightly. So we want to get that into our paintings because obviously that's going to help it look more realistic and much more natural as well. What I'm doing here with my Cretacolor is getting some dark hair details into those dark areas. So I don't just get dark hair details in just at the start. I jump in with my Cretacolor and my dark brown hairs as well as I build my layers up. So it's not just simply dark to medium to light. I'll go dark into medium, then a layer of dark hairs, and then back to medium, then to light, and then back down to dark hairs. So the reason why I'm always layering my dark hairs in is it makes sure that the light areas pop even more and it helps maintain the depth. So the depth that we've got in at the base stage with those dark base tones, it makes the fur look a lot thicker, which is really crucial, especially for fur like this, which is ultra fluffy. So always make sure you're going in with your dark hair details. And I find it makes your work pop even more. I never used to add dark hair details in like I do in the last few years. And if you compare my work from four years ago to now, there's such a stark difference. It doesn't look as kind of washed out and it really, really pings out of the paper. 
so it's always important to add those dark hair details in. Obviously, with the really bright areas of fur, you don't want to add too many in. You can bring a couple in just to define a few areas, but as you'll see down the center of the nose where it's particularly bright, I've only brought a few in above the nose. We don't want to add too much into that area because obviously the black will stand out quite a lot. You can go in with a medium orange just to pick out a few details in that area, but nothing darker than that. So a few quite niche tones I like to get into Vibrant Fur, which aren't strictly necessary as I think some people find them a little bit frightening because they are quite neon in their tone. I was a little bit scared when I ordered them, but they're brilliant just to get a pop of wow into your work. So I use the Indian Yellow from Stabilo, the Orange and the Orange Yellow and they really, really pack a punch. So for fur like this, which is so vibrant, it just really helps to just pull it up to that level really nicely. Obviously, we didn't want to use it at the base stage because these tones are very, very <laughs> aggressive in their pigment. They really, really are quite bright. So they're only really for tinting. So when you get to the final stages, I like to skim the lead over the top of my lighter areas in particular, and that just starts to tint them. So if you use a lot of ivory, what will happen is because it's not got much color to it, it's a very, very light yellow tone, it will start to wash your fur out, which for some animals is absolutely fine, especially cream animals. But for vibrant animals like this fox, you do want to make sure that there is a lot of vibrancy throughout. So just tinting on top with a really, really bright orange or a bright yellow, just a very thin layer will just help to bring a, a bit more color into the piece. So we've got some very, very fluffy ears on this fox. And as the ear is a little bit smaller, I'm using my pastel pencils just to build up the base here. It's a little bit more fiddly. So we want to go dark in the center and then we've got some nice light fur on the right. So to try and get maximum fluffiness in this ear, I'm working quite a lot of the base up in with blunt rough strokes and that's starting to get the illusion of thick fur in even as early as the base stage. So that's going to give the illusion that the ear is very, very thick, the fur. So lots of long hairs in the ear, which I'm pulling out by just wiggling my hand to give a little bit more dynamic movement, just make it look a bit more tufty. So speaking of hairs, I tend to, with the longer hairs, the tuftier hairs, hold my pastel pencils slightly further up the barrel, about halfway up. And what that does is it releases my pressure slightly. It gives me a little bit less control, which I know that sounds wrong. You would think you need more control when you're pulling your hairs out, but for the longer ones, to get nice dynamic movement in there and to get a real flow and stop them from looking too stiff is to just loosen that hand. That takes off the pressure, which means A, they come out a little bit lighter, which means thinner. So you're not pressing down as hard, which means they're not coming out as thick. And as well, you're getting a lot more loose movement in there. So less strict and stiff movement, which is perfect for the ear hair, for example. So onto the body, which is very, very orange. So I've used one of my most orange tones in my pastel collection, which is the Brown Earth 11 from Unison. The Brown Earth 12 is also really, really brilliant. But I actually only got that recently. So that was after I completed this tutorial. So you'll see the base is looking really nice and orange. Obviously, when it comes to the hairs, you want to maintain that orange tone. So I'm looking for those really bright orange tones in my pastel collection. So there's the Sanguine from Faber-Castell 188. There's obviously the orange from Stabilo as well, 221. And there's the Indian yellow from Stabilo as well, which I mentioned earlier. And of course, there's the Burnt Okra from Faber-Castell, which also has a lot of orange to it. So you'll see just pausing on the orange and jumping in with my dark hair. So this is my so this is my Bista from Stabilo, which is number 635. 
So just working in between those orange hairs and that just makes sure it looks nice and thick and we've got some nice depth, especially important in fur like this because it's obviously very tufty, very thick. So again, a nice loose hand, just making sure that these hairs come out a little bit wiggly and really nice and tufty. So the fur in this area, it's less orange, it's a little bit more yellow, but it does still have hints of orange to it. So a burnt okra from Faber-Castell 187 is perfect for this area because it is orange, but it's not quite as bright as those oranges that I've used above. So we have a nice contrast. So continuing to work these dark hair details in, which is helping to pick out these tufts even more. So to lighten the fur, I love to use my ivory, which I use plenty of around the face. So just wiggling these out, starting to pick out these individual tufts really nicely. And of course, don't forget those dark hair details as well. So this time using my Creticolor, just starting to define a few areas here. Just building up the fur a little bit more. So just a few more layers of my ivory, which is that light tone. And then just adding a pot more vibrancy with a burnt sienna from Stabilo, which is very, very highly pigmented. And then a few more dark hair details before I move on to the tail. So as always, starting with my darkest values first. So for the tail, there's quite a lot of darkness going on, especially at the bottom. So starting off with my smink black, and then as I move upwards, I'm using a couple of brown tones. And then there's a little bit of yellow at the base of the tail and a little bit of orange as well. So just mixing a few tones in there as well. So that's the first initial layer, which I'm giving a blend here. And then you'll see there's still plenty of paper showing through. So it does need a few more layers of my soft pastel. So just adding those tones in again. And then when I blend, what I'm doing this time is using my sponge as a tool to create some hair texture. So I'm using the sides of my sponge and that's starting to pull out some blunt strokes, which is going to help the fur to look really thick, really nice and thick and bushy. So the tail is very fluffy. So we want to try and work as many hair details in at the base stage as possible. So I'm now using my Creticolor to work in some of these dark hair details that we can see going on in the tail. So there's lots of them kind of randomly spotted around the tail there, little clumps, so I'm pulling those out. I'm also working some in with a dark brown tone, so my Caran d'Ache Dark Flash, which has those pink tones to it. With areas as dark as this, you want to start off really, really nice and dark, and then you can just start to gradually lift from there. It's an absolute nightmare to try and darken areas up once you get to the end and you think, oh, it's a little bit too light, especially once you get those hair details in, it's almost impossible to darken up areas without having to add loads and loads of dark hair details in right at the end which when you condense them together to try and make the area darker, it can often get a little bit too complicated. So try and, as scary as it probably sounds, start off too dark. So here you can see it looks a lot darker than what we can see in the photograph, but I want all of that depth in there, which this space is helping me achieve. And then I can start to build up gradually. So with an orange tone here, I'm just starting to very gradually lighten 
So with dark areas like this tail, it's so important to make sure that there's no dramatic changes between your light hairs, which are coming later, and your dark base. So I'm taking quite a few tones to add in between the dark layers and the light layers coming later. So you'll see all of these orange tones I'm adding in between. They're really, really important because those are our transitional tones. And it's also helping with the vibrancy in the tail. So at the end here, there's also some very subtle gray tones going on, which I want to acknowledge. some towards the back here as well. I always take the time to zoom in on your reference photo, really review the areas. Are they cool? Are they warm? I always find the easiest way to figure out if a section is cold or warm is compare it to the obvious. So for example, the back section is very, very warm. So if we're looking at the tail and we're thinking, oh, is this area here at the end of the tail, cool or warm is that gray cold or warm compare it to a really obvious warm section and if it stands out as dramatically colder or just not that same level not warm at all then obviously it is going to be cold if it looks very similar and doesn't really clash much then it's going to be warm in tone so always compare to the obvious or you can hold up a swatch of a cold gray tone or a warm gray tone and see which matches best. So lots of wiggling of my hand here, making sure these hairs come out really nice and tufty. So lots of my ivory layers going in now to start to lift the tail. So we want plenty at the top, but then starting to ease off as we get slightly further down the tail towards the bottom of the page, because then it starts to get a little bit less bright. And of course, as always, going in with a Creta color just to make sure those dark sections are nice and dark. So this tutorial is over six hours long, so you'll get it completely in full. There's no skipped sections. Obviously this is sped up slightly. I've kind of skipped over sections just to make it a little bit more compact and so you're not sat here forever, but it's just giving you a, a preview into my style also into the ways that I work and how I kind of explain stuff. Hopefully it all makes sense and you're finding it quite easy to follow. So for the full tutorial, you just need to follow the link which I'll put in my bio. I'll pop it in the description box as well. As I mentioned, all my tutorials come with the materials list and don't worry if you don't have all of those materials, you can use whatever is similar in your collection or you can message me and ask for alternatives. So just tell me what you do have and I'll try and match it with what is in the tutorial. You'll also get the outline, the reference photo and a full voiceover with my tutorials as well. Any questions, just drop them in the comment section below and I'll get back to you. Hope you've enjoyed this video and thank you so much for watching.